uh, just do a quick intro. Okay, welcome everyone. Um, I am delighted that I was able to track down our speaker <laughs> um, due to a, a time zone issue. You gotta love daylight savings time. I wish they would just abolish it. <laughs> like, oh, I'm, I'm an hour away on my calendar. <laughs> I know, I know, I know. Uh, but anyway, um, got to thank your receptionist for, for tracking you down there at your office. I, I appreciate her help in uh, locating you and, and getting everything organized. So I am very excited to speak, uh, to introduce with, with you um, Jeff Fromm, who is an award-winning author, uh, strategist, futurist, you name it, a very smart guy. I've had enjoyed our conversations so far. And I know that the content that he's got is going to be very interesting for you. So I'm going to step out of the picture now, and Jeff, I'll let you take it away. Thank you very much. Um, I'm Jeff Fromm, and uh, I guess I'd, I'd like to just give you a little bit of a, a backstory, if you will. Uh, I, I imagine you're all familiar with Google. Uh, you probably have used it once or twice. I'm known for having failed at Google more than anyone you've ever met, and that's the backstory story I want to share. I was searching for information on millennials as consumers in 2010 on Google. And every time I searched, I got gobbledygook. Imagine looking for, you know, adventure travel in Sweden and couldn't, you know, every search came back with information that made no sense. Call a friend of a friend up. She's the global head of the research department at the Boston Consulting Group. And I said, hey, you don't know me, but we have some common friends. I've been looking on Google for information on millennials as consumers, and I can find nothing. And so um, I, um, I don't know, either it does, it's a topic that's not important or no one's ever studied it. How about we study it together and we'll publish a research report. By the way, I don't have a lot of money. Would you pay for half the research? Which is the equivalent of me asking you to join me at a, a food excursion and, and I need you to pay for your own lunch because I don't have enough money. So she said, hey, Jeff, the Boston Consulting Group's not in the business of paying for other people's research. At which point I... Um, I backpedaled a little bit and said, hey, this is a really big opportunity. Why don't you take a couple of days? She said, you know what? You're right. You might be onto something. Uh, I'll call you back in a week. And I know I'll call you back in a week is code. It's code for, uh, you're probably not going to hear from me ever again. So uh, she called me back a week later and I did a happy dance. And she said, we're going to do the research and we're going to pay for half. And one thing led to another. I ended up writing my first book, Marketing to Millennials. And since 2010, I've been doing research on consumer trends. And I've had the pleasure to speak on every planet, every continent on the planet, except Antarctica, but maybe there'll be a virtual event in Antarctica. And, uh, and I've written a few books, four books, um, and I write a column weekly in Forbes. So what I wanna do is just level set briefly beyond my Google failure uh, on a little bit of the research we've seen with young people, specifically Gen Z, uh, which is uh, an important topic as we start to look forward to the future of travel and food travel, because the reality is Gen Z sets a lot of trends. They don't just set trends in social media. They set trends in technology. They set trends in food. They set trends in entertainment. And, and they set trends in travel. And, and I'm not just talking about their purchasing power. I'm talking about how they are the er, you know sort of early warning signal of whatever the next trend is. And what we learned about Gen Z, born in 96 to 2010, so birth years 1996 to 2010, is they're old souls and young bodies. Yes, they're digital social mobile to the core, but they have attitudes and beliefs and values that look more like someone who's over the age of 50, which is kind of surprising. So do not be fooled into thinking Gen Z is millennials to the second power, because that is absolutely going to be a failing strategy for you or the brand you're working on. Now, COVID has been kind of crazy, and um, my family's ended up uh, adopting a puppy, and um, we're working on training the puppy. Gen Z, however, is working on training their algorithm to make sure their social feed includes more content they want and less content they don't. So while I'm training puppies, they're training algorithms, and that's a pretty dynamic thing to think about. I don't know how many of you are trying to train your algorithm. Uh, but that's a unique feature that we've seen emerge in our research with Gen Z. Now, I know the major theme of this talk is going to be around sustainability. And Gen Z in our research is fueling many of the sustainability trends, just like they fuel entertainment trends and travel trends. 
And I want to start just saying, if you only think about sustainability, I think you're going to fail. Because in our view and in our research, what we see is sustainability is really important, but it's usually not the number one factor when it comes to purchase decisions. The number one factor might be the flavor of something or the price of something or some other thing. The challenge most brands face is they don't usually sustain advantage on price or on flavor or on that thing. And so when you have a lot of competition and those things tend to be pretty equal in price and quality, what we often find is sustainability becomes really important, not just to the consumer, but also to the employees uh, that work at, at the organization. And, and those employees oftentimes are the brand. I don't know the CEO of Starbucks. I definitely know my barista. And I don't know the, uh, the CEO of Mercadona, the Spanish grocery store chain that's well known for sustainability. But if I shop in that store, I probably know frontline workers. And so they have to understand your strategy and live that brand if the consumer is going to. And one of the biggest myths I've dispelled historically is the notion that the consumer is disloyal because it's simply not borne out by the data. The consumer is discerning. They trade up for brands they prefer, spending a small premium and using those brands more frequently. They trade down to save money when the brands are weak. And so oftentimes when I hear people say the consumer is disloyal, what I'm hearing is someone talking about a brand that's underperforming because they don't understand the consumer is the ultimate day trader. And they do this every day, giving the brands they love an advantage and giving the brands they love word of mouth. And most importantly, as you all know, word of mouse. And when I talk about brands and sustainability, the starting point for me is a brand called Ben and Jerry's, which my business partner Pip worked on for a number of years in London uh, when she worked at Unilever and led sustainability on Ben and Jerry's and other brands. And I would argue Ben and Jerry's is not really in the ice cream business. I'd argue they're in the sustainability business and they happen to make ice cream. Ben and Jerry's doesn't have proprietary cows or any cherries that haagen can't buy. What they have is a brand ethos. And so while haagen makes a fabulous product, Ben and Jerry's has something haagen doesn't and that is a sustainability and purpose advantage. And when I say sustainability, I'm talking not just about environmental justice, because we know from COVID, it extends to racial, economic, and social justice. So environmental, racial, economic, and social justice tends to cover the purpose and sustainability conversations we see happening. And when I talk about this, I like to share a business model so that those of us who are thinking about food and travel have a framework. And that is that profit matters a lot. I work at an ad agency called Barclay. We're the largest certified B Corp uh, ad agency in the United States. We have about 450 partners and, and we work with a number of travel brands. And the reality is your purpose matters a lot and your purpose should help you generate a profit. Profit is good. Without profit, Ben and Jerry's can't invest in sustainability strategies. So that purpose fuels a culture and that culture is driven usually to help the brand win inside and ultimately outside because in most cases, the brand experience isn't driven by the CEO personally, but rather the frontline people who touch the consumer. And the model for innovation in Tomorrowland looks remarkably different. Historically, we said, what is the consumer need? And if it was food, we might say, what is the palate uh, you know, insight that we're focused on when we're doing food innovation. In Tomorrowland, it's not just a need state or a pallet state. It's also, what does the world need? What do your employees need? Ultimately, what do your communities need? The consumer matters, but the Venn diagram for innovation got more complicated to include these other need states for the most successful best-in-class brands. Ultimately, innovation fuels loyalty. And loyalty means you get a small price premium and that small price premium should fuel profits and the best in class brands absolutely balance making profit with giving back. And I reference Ben and Jerry's. We have 
uh, a brand that's far lesser known at Barclay, but we have the same certified B Corp score of 93, which means we work very hard to think about environmental, economic, racial, and social justice. And we think that matters to the employees, communities, and partners that interact with our brand. And I think at the end of the day, it's hard to differentiate on price or to differentiate on a single aspect for most brands. There are outliers, there are outliers for sure, but very few brands differentiate and hold that differentiation on one item. Now, you may be wondering how in the world did we get to a world where we're talking about sustainability as a tipping point factor? I'm gonna ask you to think about an adjective. And I'm gonna use the word organized religion and I'm gonna ask you to think of what adjectives come to your mind when I say the word organized religion, I'm gonna take a moment and ask you to either share it in the chat or write it on a sheet of paper. What adjectives come to mind when you think about organized religion? Now, how many of you wrote innovation? I don't think very many. And likewise, I'm gonna use the same process. I want you to use an adjective when you think about government. In the US, what adjectives come to mind when you think about Republicans and Democrats, or if you're in a European country, what adjectives come to mind when you think about your government? How many of you are going to jot down on your paper collaboration? I don't think organized religion and governments are working effectively compared to historic standards. And we know from our research that trust in large institutions, including government, is at an all time low. And what that means is it's important for brands to have a point of view. In fact, just recently in the US, there was some Georgia election laws that became um, you know, a big topic of conversation. And brands like Coca-Cola and Delta Airlines CEOs came out with a point of view. Now, Coca-Cola and Delta Airlines are not brands we historically associate with sustainability and innovation. However, when we are looking at how brands need to participate, being silent is no longer a path forward. So while Patagonia has reinvented their sustainability strategy from do no harm to protect and defend, which is a major shift, we expect that from perhaps a brand like Patagonia. But brands like Walmart are best in class thinkers. Uh, the Spanish grocery store I've referenced earlier, um, uh, Mercadona, uh, you know, best in class sustainability strategy, brands like Unilever and Procter, Procter and Gamble. These conversations are happening at major, iconic, mature brands that understand how important this is. Even brands like BlackRock uh, have, have come out and BlackRock is a multi-trillion dollar uh, uh, investment fund uh, and said, the purpose of companies isn't just to make a profit, it's also to add good to the world. And, and don't think for a minute making a profit isn't important. It's radically important. It fuels that infographic I shared, that model. It fuels everything in that model. But if you only focus on profit, you are unlikely to be a best-in-class brand in Tomorrowland because that is not the trend today. Consumers look at the entirety of the brand, the whole brand, when they make decisions. And right now, consumers are yearning for travel. The demand for travel far exceeds the supply or ability with COVID to travel. Whether that's a trip to Canada, California, or Sweden, I assure you, people are thinking and yearning. And, and frankly, I, I often reflect on how dynamically different a year has been. A year ago, I started my, my year in Hong Kong giving a speech for 30 minutes in January. And then I traveled from city to city giving speeches up until literally in the US about mid-March when I was in Vegas. And then I gave a big speech and the next day, nobody traveled and nobody did anything. And so it was an abrupt shift, but that doesn't mean people aren't yearning for experiences. And your challenge is to think about your brand and the opportunity to create a Venn diagram that's unique to your brand that allows people to feel safe, that allows them to afford to have the kind of adventures they want and feel like they're adding good to the world along the way. And if you do that, you're gonna create 
an unstoppable, strong, powerful brand. And I'm gonna share some examples, some tactical examples of brands that I think have done a nice job during COVID of being empathetic and of pivoting. Uh, my first example is gonna be ESPN. Uh, I don't know how many of you uh, saw The Last Dance, but consumers are spending enormous amounts of time at home. Their home is their yoga studio, it's their restaurant, it's their place to sleep, it's their place to worship, it's their place to relax and unwind, it's their everything place. And as consumers spend more of their time at home, that means they're getting less of what they historically got in the way of entertainment and food and other things outside of home. And ESPN radically changed their production schedule in order to bring us a series on Michael Jordan and the Chicago Bulls, which was appreciated by many millions of people. And I, I ended up writing a story about that in Forbes uh, last year. Puerto Rico didn't try to convince consumers to visit Puerto Rico. What they did was they said, you know, experience Puerto Rico virtually and, and enjoy what we have to offer virtually, knowing uh, having been to Puerto Rico, it's a magical place and, uh, and, and consumers will want to come back when it's safe. And so helping consumers get that opportunity virtually was a smart way for them to keep their brand uh, omnipresent and for them to create empathetic opportunities. It didn't probably drive revenue, but I'm sure it drove some brand affinity. Our client Delta Faucets, uh, interestingly, uh, makes a faucet that can be timed to an app. So I did not realize how long 20 seconds is, which is the standard we're supposed to wash our hands. And Delta's app will turn the water on and give you soap, and then it goes off for 20 seconds. So instead of washing for too short a time, shame on you, Jeff, now I wash for a whole 20 seconds because the water doesn't come back on until I spent 20 seconds washing my hands. That's a brand that made a significant change that we helped them with as a result of COVID. Likewise, travel giant Aspen Snowmass, known for their amazing ski resorts, and I was just in Snowmass a couple days ago skiing, um, had to reimagine what the world might look like last year when they were first forced to close in March. And they started thinking about what their brand would need to do because when you take away the month of March, the financial viability of the ski business becomes completely jeopardized. I mean, the season is only about four months long in total and March is the apex of spring break travel. And so COVID forced them to reimagine and rethink how they move their business forward, particularly if global warming isn't checked. I give a shout out to Visit Dallas, which was one of the first brands that we saw here in the US um, to go through and look at the safety of visitors as the number one priority uh, last year and partner and using partnership with the Global Bio Risk Advisory Council. So meeting planners would know that they had really put in a process that would enable the planner to make a choice about future events that would be favorable to their brand. And no sustainability story is incomplete without the amazing Oatly brand, which I love to consume from time to time uh, because honestly, I'm lactose intolerant, a little too much information for some of you. And Oatly, uh, another Swedish brand, um, got uh, you know a little bit of news media and I kind of like it for a ditch milk campaign. Um, and when I say news media, there was some controversy, but I think controversy can be a good thing because it started a conversation and this brand is on fire. It combines flavor with sustainability at a price point that's a premium that appeals to a consumer who wants all of that. And that's the kind of way I like to think about Venn diagrams. You have to think about your specific brand, but what is that Venn diagram that allows you to create that unfair advantage the way Oatly has at the center of flavor and sustainability. And frankly, it's not just a brand uh, being consumed uh, across the pond in Sweden. Uh, I see it in almost every grocery store I go in at this point. And I know millions of consumers like me have uh, tried it. I've tried to hit a few examples during this presentation 
to just give you a sense of, um, of where the trends are. And, and, and again, if I were to recap, I think the important thing to understand is sustainability matters a lot, but it doesn't replace the need to innovate on quality, price, and other factors. What it does is change the model and change the process, which is why I introduced that new model of thinking. Uh, I'm happy to give you a free copy of the book. You can download it. If there are challenges downloading it because of the number of guests who are international, and I know that sometimes it is hard when it's international, I've included my email address and I want you to reach out and I'm happy to get you a free copy. If you purchase a copy on Amazon, 100% of the money you spend will go to the Brand Lab, which is a social justice organization that we are affiliated with at Berkeley. I'm grateful for the opportunity to share this. I hope there are some questions. I tried to keep this to 25 minutes, uh, knowing that uh, some of you might have a question or two that you'd wanna ask. Super, thanks, Jeff. Hey, um, could you go back to your Venn diagram? I would like to understand that better. There we go. Uh, so is it that one or is it the... Go back, go back through it again? No, perhaps? no, no, the, the, um, uh, the Venn, is this the Venn diagram or the one that's two slides later? Sorry, you're right. So what I do when I'm working with a brand and this is just a hypothetical Venn diagram, okay? is I try to understand what would be unique to that brand, you know? Um, and, and so it could be three circles, four circles, five circles, I, you know, it varies, but what is gonna give this brand the opportunity to be uniquely positioned to the consumer and employees they serve? Okay. And so it's sort of a hypothetical, I, as I think about food and travel, two of my favorite uh, topics. Uh, you know, I think adventures at the center of the bullseye, but there are a lot of adventures. I could have an adventure here in the United States. I could adventure in Europe. I could have an adventure in Asia. You know, what is unique to the adventure being offered by that brand? How can it be done safely? With COVID, safety is going to be a big issue. How can it be done affordably? Without affordability, you're not going to have scale. I mean, I could create an amazing adventure if you want to go to space, you know, uh, you know, but you can buy a ticket. I think Elon Musk sells them. I just can't afford them. So you have to make it affordable at some level if you want scale. And then I think at the end of the day, people are thinking about their footprint and how do you do it sustainably? And if, if I feel better about myself as a human, I'm happier to spend the money to buy the Oatly. It's worth the price premium. Now, if I don't like the flavor, I'm not in the game, right? And so that's where you have to balance all of this. So don't think for a minute, the quality of the product doesn't matter. It's absolutely job one. But lots of people have competing products. You know, I, before uh, last year, I gave a speech in Copenhagen. It was awesome. And then I traveled around that area. But I could have given a speech in, you know, Barcelona. Or I could have, there are a lot of awesome cities in Europe, right? So um, I'm using that by way of example to say, you know, we have to think about competition and not just our direct competitors, but the indirect alternatives the consumer has. Uh, and when it comes to food travel, I think there are a lot of indirect competitors too. So when you were saying before that a company needs to create its own Venn diagram, so would they take something like this and then find the words that speak to them? I think you have to make it unique to your brand. And so this, this is just for illustrative purposes. This is not an example for a specific client. Okay. So you could have any number of circles, but find those, those brand values, your brand promise, and maybe distill that into three, four, five, meaningful words, right? And then create a diagram around it. Is that the idea? Yeah. And, yeah. and that diagram is meant to inform questions and ideas, right? So the old model of innovation is what does my consumer need? The new model of innovation, which I referenced in that, is what does the world need? What do my employees need? What does my community need? And what does the consumer need, right? So I think we're living in an era where the tools we learned in school 10 or 15 years ago or 20 years ago or whatever the case may be, were built sort of in a different era. You know, now we live in an era where people have instant access to everything from a modern day Swiss army knife. This is not a phone. Nobody will call you back. And they're checking out your brand from this modern day Swiss army knife in real time. I have a daughter who works at Pinterest and I was like, if you were going to dinner in New York, how would you do that? And she's like, I'd get an Uber from the airport when I landed. 
and I'd figure out the restaurant based on ratings and reviews on my way to where I was headed, right? Like to my Airbnb. So like, that's the new normal. Yeah. It's not the normal I grew up with, right? But that's the new normal. And I think that's the new normal that all of us are thinking about who, you know, when we have more experience, we have old models. So I'm trying to introduce some new models here. Okay, super. Uh, I would like to invite our delegates to type your questions in the Q&A window for, for Jeff. And we already have two questions. The first one here is many multinational companies talk about sustainability, but isn't there a risk for greenwashing if the process isn't genuine? but more of a PR tactic. It really needs to be integrated into the values of the companies at first. Um, Your thoughts on that? Couldn't agree more. Greenwashing is uh, a tremendous risk for large and small brands. Large brands get called on it, called on it more if they do it. Um, the best in class brands focus on making purpose a verb. And if you Google search, which I told you I'm pretty bad at, you're going to find purpose as a noun. So I'm saying use purpose as a verb, which means you put together a plan and you take action and you make sure that action occurs and the communication occurs inside your organization before you go outside. And if you do that, you're not going to get accused of greenwashing. You don't have to wait 10 years to tell people about your purpose and sustainability initiatives, but the first people you tell shouldn't be done through a press release to consumers in Wall Street. Rather, you need to walk the walk and you need to make sure your employees see it and feel it. So you're not called out. And I could share examples of companies that have done it wrong. I could also share examples of companies that have done it right. There is a little bit of subjectiveness to it, but most of the companies that do it well spend some time, money, and energy taking action and making sure the internal stakeholder is in the loop so that uh, so they avoid that. And, and if, you're, if, you, if you have a messy house, you don't invite guests over, right? You, you clean your house first. So if your brand is a little messy, uh, my team uh, that I referenced works on sustainability strategy and the book has a workshop that's free that's included that we do for brands. Um, focus on cleaning your house first and then invite some guests over. Okay, super. Um, I just put the link Did to that your... address the greenwashing question that the, the person asked in the... Uh, if not, I think they'll I'll... let us know if, if they have more questions. And I'd put the link to your book in the chat window. Um, I noticed I got an email from someone in Europe who said they had trouble downloading the book because it required a state. So um, send me I... an email. Yeah, and we'll get you books. It's, okay. it's, it's uh, designed for there are limitations to the free tool we used. And I think one of them is that uh, it does not work well across borders. Yeah, yeah. Put a, um, put a fictitious state or, or just email me. Yeah, just choose, choose any state. Pick something that, that looks nice. Or send to me an email and we'll give you the book. There you go. I'll send you the book today. Okay, so this person would like to um, hear a, an example of a travel company, and I would add, or destination that really follows a sustainability strategy. And then I'd like to tie that into what you were saying before that you said you could give examples of companies that don't do it well. So maybe you could give us a compare and contrast, one that's doing a great job and one that's not so great. I don't want to start calling people out for being bad at what they do. But well, maybe maybe, maybe where there's opportunities start, to, yeah, to yeah, improve. Sure. <laughs> yeah, I mean, um, I'll tell you one of my first experiences that I thought was pretty, pretty amazing um, several years ago, and it was probably too early and too small a piece of their corporate strategy. But because I write for Forbes, I was invited on a free trip from Carnival Cruise Lines, and they were doing basically a cruise to the Caribbean. And uh, they invited my family and we all went. And it wasn't a cruise with lots of activities and shows, but rather when we went to the island, we had a chance to spend a half day on multiple sessions, picking different activities that we could engage in. And I, the first day went and taught Spanish to first graders. Now I don't speak a word of Spanish. So it was using flashcards and I was having so much fun with my flashcards showing them the, you know, the words, cause I don't speak Spanish, but I'm acting it out. The kids were loving it and they're coming up and, you know, ha having fun. I ended up having multiple half day sessions at that event. And then I also did other activities and Carnival um, cur curated uh, things that would allow, you know, multiple people from the cruise to go to different activities. So there were a couple hundred spots available across various ways to give back. 
Some of those ways were in schools, some of those ways were helping people uh, in, in factories with manufacturing. There were various events and, um, and I thought it was a brilliant strategy. Unfortunately, I don't know that it ever took off. Again, it was a little before uh, this topic became so front and center. And frankly, I think it was probably such a small piece of their total revenue stream that it may not have gotten the attention uh, that it should or, or could have. Um, but I will tell you, having been on many cruises and spent a decent amount of money on those, those trips, um, it's one of the more meaningful experiences I've had. And I didn't miss the silly shows. And I really enjoyed the opportunity to, to do that. Uh, and and uh, I, would have, I would have recommended it to a friend in a heartbeat over an Alaskan cruise or whatever cruise. You know, I've, I've looked at cruising, you know, uh, Sweden and Norway and stuff like that. And those, those, those would be amazing cruises, but, but, uh, but this had a certain amount of meaning. Um, now, the key part there was Carnival curated for me. I, I would have never been able to find a school or the other events. They had a series of events you could do while you were on this cruise. I mean, it was a very short, like five day, you know, leave Miami, come back a couple days later. Wonderful experience. They curated those opportunities. So if I was thinking about like, let's say I was doing a European river trip uh, and I was gonna be able to go on a seven day European river trip. The travel promoter has to curate, hey, you could go on a bike ride today when you're in Prague, or you could do this thing with the local community instead if you don't wanna go on that tour. It has to be curated by the brand because I'm not gonna find that on my own, right? Um, and I think the, the goal is to allow people to feel better about themselves as humans uh, when they do that. Um, I think in terms of other brands that have done it, uh, Chipotle, um, which is a quick service restaurant, has just literally launched an app that shows how much carbon is reduced when you make certain choices and things like that. They've integrated it into their mobile technology. I'm not that familiar with it because it just launched in the last couple of days. I saw a couple screenshots of it. Uh, as they tried to get my attention for one of the Forbes things I was writing. And I was like, wow, I'll have to look at that more later. Um, I think uh, in terms of uh, experiences, I mean, you know, to me, what is the intersection of a European trip that has all the wonderful things of that particular European destination that, that I, the way I would think about it would be and, and was created by the Peace Corps? So I'm not literally saying Peace Corps, like it's a year long experience, right? But you're going to Paris, you're going to Munich, you're going to wherever that destination is, you're gonna have that curated experience, but you're gonna also have options to do things that aren't the standard, if you will. Um, <clears throat> as I look at some of the US brands in the ski industry, I think Aspen Snowmass and, and several other brands, um, you know, Jackson Hole Resorts are thinking about every facet of environmental um, and social justice uh, as they have hired people full time, dedicated their larger brands to, um, you know, think, think about this topic. And you see it at every touch point. You know, don't flush this toilet, don't do this, do that. You know, these cups are recyclable, et cetera. So, you know, those are some examples of brands I'm familiar with from my recent sort of ski industry. Um, experience. Uh, I'm sure there are hundreds of brands doing this well. I, I don't honestly spend all my time on travel, so I don't know that I have uh, all these examples, but I could look and peel the onion back. The goal is not to be um, so forward-leaning that you appeal to the hard, hard core, generally speaking, person, like I have a colleague who only drives electric vehicles, only eats vegetarian, only uses plant-based products, never uses plastic. I think that's too niche for most of the people on this call. The goal is to allow the masses to affordably feel better about themselves, experience part of what makes your brand unique today, historically, but also, you know, come away with something that is shareworthy. And the show on the cruise is far less shareworthy than feeling like you impacted six-year-olds in their classroom. Interesting. So I think that's how I would think about it, but I would think about it at scale because otherwise, you know, who is the consumer you're serving? 
if you're serving that person who spent their entire life in the Peace Corps, designing that is probably not going to have mass appeal. Mm -hmm. If you're doing it for the per person who aspired to be in the Peace Corps but never was, then you take a different view of what that would be. And even in every local market, that might look very different. If I was going to Africa, that might be, um, you know, working in an agriculture environment to try to help create a more sustainable agriculture ecosystem, knowing that food insecurity is such a big topic there. If I was going to another place, it might be very different. And, and so I wouldn't want to generalize without understanding the nuance of that brand. Sure. All right. Thank you for that. We have another question here. Uh, what type of sustainable travel trends are you predicting for the next five to 10 years? It's a good question. It's, you know, 10 years is a long time. Let's start um, with five years. You know, yeah, I'm going to say, how about, how, about we, how about we kind of go just near in? I think um, post pandemic. Near in, yeah, I think near in right away, people would love to understand how choices, how their personal choices impact. Uh, environmental, economic, racial, and social justice. So when I pick this choice on a menu versus that choice, you know, here's here's the impact you're making. And if you can make it that way and still deliver on flavor and price and things like that, or the travel, you know, choice, you know, we put together this trip, we're using an electric bus to take all of you to see this thing. I, I mean, I think those kinds of things, when the sacrifice is small to the consumer and you quantify their decision and their impact back, the opportunity to build scale for your brand is significant. The key point has, is it has to be relatively easy and the sacrifice has to be small. If it's really hard to do, most people won't do it. If it's really easy to do, more people will do it. And so I think you have to think about that. I think most people aspire to lead a more sustainable life. But if it costs me twice as much to buy a sustainable vehicle or take a sustainable vacation, that's not gonna work. How do you design it so the cost is about the same and you take some things out of the current product cost and add some things back that make me feel better as a human without destroying the product? And that's sort of an oversimplification of it, right? It's like, here's my product cost. I'm going to develop these series of things. What am I removing that's expensive but not valuable? And what am I adding that creates an emotional connection that's very valuable might not be that expensive. It's not like it's expensive for me to teach using flashcards in a school for six-year-olds. That was engineered by the Carnival brand. It's probably more expensive for them to deliver, you know, a champagne brunch or a famous entertainer on the ship who has to be flown in on a helicopter, give a, give, you know, a performance and then flown out in a helicopter. So you're going to have to engineer and reimagine. And I think the consumer is looking for unique flavor experiences and unique life experiences, but they also want the old stuff when I go to Paris or I go to Copenhagen or I go to Oslo or I go to wherever I'm going. They want to be able to see those historic things. So it's going to be a mix of old and new coming together, a mix of things I might expect when I go to that place and things that are completely unexpected. And you want to give people a finite number of choices. You don't want to give them 20 choices. You want to give them a couple because too many choices becomes confusing. And, and I think good best in class brands will create video content that allow the consumer to help make their decision before they show up. So they understand what those choices are before I go on the vacation. Hmm. Someone was saying that they also think that the onus is on the brands to make information about their impact available to consumers. I think that'll be price of admission. I think, and I think, I think if they're not willing to do that, they're gonna be failing. But, I, but I, I think making it inexpensive and easy to do the right thing in terms of not too hard, especially if your consumer's a little bit older, um, you know, I think that's going to be important. And I say a little bit older because it's going to be easier for a younger person in some cases to engage in certain sustainable behaviors. Hey, we want you to walk to this thing that's a mile and a half away. Yeah. A 65-year-old consumer might say, yeah, I can not do that. So much. You know, not so much. <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, we got one more question. Maybe we should make this for our last one for the day. So in what ways do you think slow travel matches with the needs of Generation Z or Z? I didn't hear the first part of your question. In what, Kate, in what ways do... In what ways do you think slow travel matches 
with the needs of Generation Z or Z. What is the, what is the definition of slow travel uh, in your view? Well, um, slow travel would be um, low impact. You know, like like uh, take photographs, not stones or not pieces of the ancient monument, that kind of thing. Um, not being in a rush to to you know today is Brussels, tomorrow is Amsterdam, kind of thing. Um, taking in the local culture and sites and people rather than uh, staying in the big international hotel brands, things like that. Sure. Quality, so, not quantity. Yeah, it's a great question. First of all, our research says Gen Z is the most interested generation in sustainability. You can email me if you're interested. I mean, we've studied sustainability across generations. And um, it's not unimportant to... Gen X or to silent generation, but it's far less important than it is to Gen Z or millennials. So there's a slope with Gen Z here, millennials just behind, then Gen X. So if you were to look across generations, it's, you know, their expressed interest is highest among the young, youngest and it declines slightly from there. Um, the notion of slow travel is not gonna appeal to everyone, but I don't think your goal should be to appeal to everyone. I think what you have to do is design different products to deal the you know to meet different needs of different segments, and uh, and I think the the notion that Gen Z wants unique experiences means that mixing in some of what is historically famous about Sweden, Spain, or any other place, along with something that's unexpected. The expected unexpected unexpected Venn diagram that I didn't show. That's the one that probably appeals most to Gen Z, right? Because the expected is part of how I curate my identity in Instagram. When I was in Copenhagen giving the speech, I think there were more people taking pictures of the Love Copenhagen sign than the Van Gogh Museum, right? Like it's, it's just a man-made sign that somebody in the tourism industry put up there with a big you know, thing in a park and it was you know, crazy busy, but they're curating that Instagram feed at the same time you know, they do have a very high expressed desire to get off the path. Can you engineer that at a price point they can afford? If you can engineer it at a price point they can afford, now you have the opportunity to create scale. Because price will matter more typically to a younger consumer who's more focused on the experience than the first class seat on an airplane or the you know, international hotel. Mm -hmm. uh, and we've seen that in our data set, which, which means there could be opportunities for smaller brands to, to build some scale by mixing uh, the two pieces together, the expected, unexpected. Obviously, each of these brands has things that are unique that you have to look at. And, and so I can't give a one size fits all approach to that. Yeah, it's never an easy answer. And I, I guess the, the takeaway here is know your customer, you know, know, know who you're do designing a product for and, and the messaging that you need to send to that specific target market. What is the consumer need? What is the employee need? What is the world need? Yeah. What is your local community need? If you can think about these kinds of questions, as opposed to only the consumer, which is clearly important, you probably will be in a position to create one of those most successful brands financially. And if you can balance making a profit, which is really important with adding good, more and more people will talk about your brand. Indeed, the old people planet profit uh, message for sure. Um, Jeff, good stuff. You, you just, you know so much. I, I really appreciate your time and I know everyone else did. I could tell by the, the questions that people were really excited about your, your words of wisdom. And I would encourage everyone to download Jeff's book. And if you're not if you in the US- problem, Yeah, email me. Yeah, just, just uh, shoot to Jeff a quick email and he'll be happy to get that out to you. So with that, uh, it's, it's, it's a wrap for our first day of Foodtrex Global 2021. And we look forward to seeing everyone tomorrow at the same start time, which is 1 p.m. London time for day two of Foodtrex Global. Thank you again, everyone. 